want to talk about tonight is the budget. We'll go over some of the things that's happened uh, in uh, the Senate and the legislature this last year. I believe that uh, knowledge is power, and I really want you to have some of the true facts and figures that are out there. I've been in the newspaper business for a number of years, and uh, there was a time whenever I would print the majority of press releases that would come out of the Capitol. Uh, what I have learned since I've been in the Capitol is that those press releases do not always equal what's actually going on. Yep. Uh, so I said it out. I said, I said it at meeting. I didn't see that happen. Uh, case in point today, we read the editorial in the Oklahoma today about uh, Senator Smalley out of Lincoln County uh, on being single-handedly responsible for diverting $50 million out of the county roads fund because of the $75 million uh, for the railroad. There are some bits and pieces in there that are, are factual. Uh, when they sold the railroad between Tulsa and Oklahoma City, it was for $75 million. It was going to be absorbed just into ODOT, and yet our laws, the Constitution says, that any sale of that property railroad must be used with railroads. And uh, we have a number of railroads that are still on operation in Oklahoma, so Senator Smalley asked for an Attorney General's opinion, which froze that $75 million. And uh, so it may end up with ODOT, it may not end up with ODOT, we'll see how it goes. That being related to the County Roads and Bridges Fund, that discussion never happened. Uh, it was never there at any appropriation meetings or anything else, and I'm going to go over some of those things tonight. I want to point out several things to you, that uh, handouts that uh, I think that I was surprised by. These handouts that I have tonight are actual handouts from the Senate. Uh, this sheet that you got on a large sheet is where I'm going to start tonight. I'm just kind of show you a few things. Uh, I know a small print, uh, but and I've got the whole thing up here as they gave me on a chart. I, I did these for this meeting here tonight. These are apportionments that were put out by the finance of the, uh, the Senate and, of course, by the legislature. And those for this last budget year are not finished yet because our budget year is not finished yet. When we talk about apportionments, we're talking about off-the-top money. And so whenever we get around to being able to appropriate uh, a budget, we are appropriating only between 43 and 44 cents out of every dollar from previous legislators that have been up there and were term limited out and very few of them up there, there were things that were set in place, many of those by percentages, and those just keep growing and growing and growing. Whenever that we pass no new taxes, <coughs> state question 640, uh, those of you that are in business or have been around businesses, you realize that we have new fees every time that we turn around. Mm -hmm. And uh, those have doubled, some have tripled. And tonight we'll talk about revolving funds in just a little bit and when we get over to the budget. This is a total list of all of the apportionments that come off the top before we are able to appropriate any money. So I've been a lot of talk about like the motor vehicle tax, and if you looked on your sheet of paper, you would run down to a motor vehicle tax on that. And let's see, it would be front side of that down right next to the bottom, one of those big charts that's left over there, and down the bottom. You would notice that sale of motor vehicles, there are percentages of that is taken out, the total apportionment being about $784 million. Uh, and uh, whenever we come across, you see from the top where all that money then is tracked, some into the general fund, some into state transportation, some is returned back to the counties and highways, the $52 million. There are some is returned back to fund county government, almost $6 million. And then it goes back into your cities and your towns. You follow the way across school districts, and then over the right side it says other, and those are all the other numbers that are broken down and shows you where all of that money is being spent. Now, one of the things that happened within the Senate this year is that we decided early on as a uh, Republican caucus and really as the uh, uh, Appropriations uh, Committee, and all senators are on the general appropriations, and uh, Republican and Democrat. And, uh, I just want to pause there for a moment. It's easy not to be the ruling party because all you get to do is just sit back and gripe that it's not working. Mm -hmm. And uh, but however, I want you to know they were in on the same uh, general appropriations committee meetings as I sat in on and the rest of them. We decided as a Senate that we need to cap these apportionments because they grow. Like the motor vehicle tax at 18 percent keeps growing more and more and more all of the time. And uh, we're hearing some things concerning how that cap that we've done this year has damaged, especially our roads and bridges, 
And then, of course, in the wake of all the flooding that's gone on, we've capped that money and we don't have the money in the roads and bridges. You have a budget before you that we'll look at in just a little bit. You've also got a list before you of all the money that was taken from all the different revolving funds. When we look at the county commissioners and talk to them, they have a five-year road and bridges plan. Gene Wallace out of Muskogee, who is leading that group, and I've known Gene for years, $120 million a year keeps them on their five-year road and bridges plan. This year, their apportionment was $120 million capped there, and they received the 2015 same one that it would have done if we had not capped that apportionment. Now, because of the tax, and excuse me, the cap on that apportionment, there was $21 million that was above the $120 million that was in above there that we can put back into the general fund that we're going to be able to now appropriate for other areas. So we funded them at $120 million exactly as they asked to be funded. Number two, we took $50 million out of that account, out of that revolving fund account, go back into the general fund, and you probably heard that much in the news. What you did not hear in the news is what left them in that revolving fund account was $216 million. That's before we put the $120 million into it this year. And so in the CIRB fund, even after the $50 million was taken out to help balance the budget, there is $216 million in there. Now, we're working with county commissioners. I was in Okmulgee County a week ago Monday in a commissioner meeting talking to them about our, our roads and what we can do. McIntosh County talking to them about what our roads in McIntosh County, what we can do. Uh, Fusky County uh, talking to Bill Elliott, our emergency management director, even this morning about what we can do. We're all applying for federal aid, FEMA money that's coming in, and they're a major part of getting our roads and bridges back. The estimate that has already been published, if the federal government did not put a dime into restoring our roads and bridges, maybe you read the article, it's $200 million. That's how much damage the last flooding has done. Keep in mind that in the county commissioner fund, the CIRB fund, there is $216 million still sitting in there for this next budget before they get their $120 million appropriation. Now. When I look at revolving funds, you've got a uh, sheet of paper that we handed out a few moments ago that just simply listed all of the revolving funds. It's like this one right here. When we talk about the funds that were taken to balance the budget, I want us to understand concerning these funds, if you're a, a budget, if you have a, a business or if you have a household, I would dare say a number of you here tonight have multiple checking accounts uh, in our businesses. I have a checking account for the news leader. I have a checking account for my real estate. I have a checking account for my office supply. I have a checking account for our flower shop that we have. We operate about four different checking accounts. My wife and I own all of those businesses. So we just ask a general question, whose money is that in those checking accounts? That'd be ours. When I look at all these revolving funds, these agencies believe this money belongs to them. This is your checking accounts. You are the owner of all of this money. And so I ask you, is there a time in your life that you said, honey, I think we need to transfer some funds out of this account into this account so we can make our budget meet this month? We have done that. And so we talk about removing some of these monies out of these accounts. These accounts are still in operation. They're still able to do what they need to do as far as the government is concerned, but we took excess money out of those accounts. I don't think for a moment that they are hurting. We'll make two points. Number one, we heard how much DHS needed more money. We finished our appropriations for DHS this year, and before I'm even home from session, there's a semi-trailer and a bobtail parked at the DHS office in Okima, unloading brand new office furniture into that office. That's, that's your money that's going in there. I don't know how many more they did like that. The whole idea, if you leave money in there, we're going to spend it somewhere and going on. Now, when we go back to this chart over here that we are only appropriating 44 cents out of every dollar, we're ending up with accounts growing like this. Now, those are on fees. Fees ought to be charged for a reasonable service 
that would fund the government enough to handle whatever services they're having. Some of you may remember last year whenever they helped balance the budget by taking money from some of the revolving funds and said that's one-time money. Yeah. And we cannot do that again. We've done that again this year in some of those same funds, which means is that what we took last year to help balance the budget, those accounts grew back within one year. So some of the legislation that we looked at this year was doing away with some of the fees that some of these agencies are charging. And so we have, yes, a $611 million budget deficit. Uh, we're anticipating, if oil doesn't turn around and, some, and uh, oil is a catalyst for us, uh, we're going to anticipate probably a half billion dollar deficit coming into this next year as well. That's kind of what we're looking at. Now, so those are the accounts that we're taking. I put out an overview of our budget this year. This is the first year in the history, at least the recent history, that anybody can remember whenever we put out a full budget of what the state of Oklahoma has. In the small sheet that you have here on the general appropriations, is broken down by the various committees. And so when we look at the State Department of Education on this one, they will remain flat. There was no uh, money uh, that was increased, no money that was taken away. Now in a budget year where there are a number of those that were cut, uh, we felt good about public education being exactly where that it was. The Department of Transportation, at the bottom of uh, that one, you can see that they were cut 6.25%. But keep in mind, they are also still being appropriated $184 million. Now, in this budget, as I mentioned a while ago, one of the new things that we have done this year, and we're glad to have it finally in there, is that we hear a lot of times about the state of Oklahoma having $7.1 billion budget that we're operating off of. And yet, and I believe it's on page 17 of this, if you look at transportation, this budget it's not a $7 billion budget. This is a $24 billion budget. That's what we're working on in the state of Oklahoma. And so when you go over to transportation on page 17, you're going to see the $184 million that was appropriated by the state. And then if you look at all of the other money, the dedicated funds that are coming in from all these on the side over here that comes back into transportation, interagency funds that are spent, other funds, now, other funds can be federal funds, they can be grants, they can be fees, can be a number of things and other funds. They're receiving $575 million. And when you get to the end of that, ODOT has $1,654,501,483 in their budget. That's how much money they're working on on roads inside the state of Oklahoma. That's a lot of money. And so when we look at what we can do on the state's end, that they can still receive the same money they're receiving, they can get by. They can get by. And you look back on this other budget, what they were actually cut in transportation from the year before was about, from 197 down to 184, it's about $13 million. Now, if you got a $1.6 billion budget and losing $13 million, it's not going to put you in the courthouse. Losing $13 million out of there is still not going to stop them from fixing the county roads and county bridges. We did not balance the budget on the backs of our county. Whenever we pay that bond off, that thing, the Native American Culture Center, will belong to Oklahoma City, no more draining the people of Oklahoma. Now, to me, we began to look at just on a business end of that. We can either pay $6.9 million from now on, $1.9 million until all of the simply deteriorates and out there and, and we're done with it. Or we can add a little bit more money to it and get rid of it. Now, I said, why don't you give it to Oklahoma City the way they want it, or why don't you sell it? Number one, we tried to sell it, nobody's buying. Number two, those of you that are in business and those of you that are not in business know that you cannot sell or give away mortgage property. I think they send you to prison over those things. The state of Oklahoma has a mortgage on the property where the museum is setting that we're paying on on the five million. To make it sellable, we need to finish it so we can sell it. It's kind of like wrecking your car. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody else runs in your car, you gotta get it fixed to sell it. If you don't get it fixed, you can't sell it. So for me, that was just a good business decision that we were able to make and move forward in that area. And I think it was a good vote. 
People have questioned me a whole lot on the OK Pops Museum in Tulsa. One of the things that I told you whenever I was running for office that I'll come back and I'll always shoot straight with you and I want to do that. I voted for that museum and I want to tell you why. When we begin to look at Oklahoma, we have three major things, industries if you will, that stimulate our economic development. Number one is oil and gas, and we all know where oil and gas is today. Number two is agriculture. Number three is tourism. Last year, tourism netted to our state coffers $400 million in tax revenue. Now, we had a $600 million deficit. Add another $400 million to that and see what you come up with. We're talking about a seven billion dollar industry in Oklahoma every year. So we said, let's look at OK Pops. Bring together a proven leader with Dr. Blackburn. In 1998, there were two museums that were approved by the state of Oklahoma. One was the Native American Cultural Center that was run by state. The other was the historical museum and society that sits just right across from the capital. Many of you visited that, you've been there. I know that in the session we have school bus after school bus coming in and going through. That is finished. Both of those were in 1998. Dr. Blackburn led that ahead of time and under money. The 66, or the Route 66 Museum in Clinton, done. Another museum he had done. I've got all this documentation with me. Three times, business plan, he had led, he had built it, brought it in under estimate, and all three of those never come back for any more state funding. We are paying today $2.5 million in a bond issue on the History Center across from the Capitol. <coughs> that will mature in 2018. We can take $25 million bond to build the Pops Museum under Dr. Blackman. The bond payment is $1.5 million per year. He has raised private money between 15 and 18 that we can get started on the Pops Museum. But take 2.5 million we're now paying, and I know that would be over 2018. That 2.5 turns into 1.5. Now, if we take the taxes that's going to generate off of that, it is estimated, and I have those figures up here tonight, that even in the first year it will generate $1.7 million in taxes. Following that, it will estimate between two and three million dollars a year on the low end of taxing. Now these figures are not just pulled out of the air. Mike Macy, Senator Macy, that's our finances. Uh, he's pulled all those things together. Brilliant individual. Looks at it. Sit up on the Senate floor. Talk about the same thing I'm talking about tonight. It is an investment that will generate three million dollars a year. Now in business from time to time, you have to borrow money to I make money. Now I hear individuals say, we're not in the business of making money. Yes, we are. The way we've been in business of making money is we charge fees. We say, well, say question 640 said no new taxes. Look back to 2001 and see what our budget was in 2001. It's a little over $5 billion. 2014, $7.1 billion. We've grown by $2 billion. Where's that money going to come from? And if we don't start thinking like businesses, that we're out here investing and bringing money in as businesses would bring money in, we're going to keep charging people to go to our state parks. We're going to keep charging people more fees. We're going to go up, 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 up on our fees because we are not cutting government. Now, the question comes in, when are you going to start cutting government? <coughs> Two things about that. And I made it the statement to our caucus. I made it to others. I do not believe in choking anything to death. Whenever I was a child, Raised up in Arkansas, we had to wring our chickens' necks to eat them. <laughs> Scald them and pluck them. Today I will eat chicken, but it's, after, it's under duress. <laughs> if we see a program up there that's not working, let's cut it. I recommended this year that we cut the Merit Protection Program. It's one of my agencies. $600,000. Well, we cut some of their funding. We cut some of their help. But we haven't cut the agency yet. I'm looking at recommending moving more of the agencies and consolidation together, but be up front with them and say, we're not going to do this anymore. 
instead of just bleeding them and choking them to death. Let's be wise. Let's be honest. <coughs> Until that time comes, we've got bills we've got to pay. My suggestion, which was shot down with double barrel shotguns, with the Native American Cultural Center, instead of us giving it to Oklahoma City, let's operate it ourselves. Let's build the hotels. Let's rent those out. Make the money that we need to make and take some of the tax burden off of our businesses and off of our citizens. And immediately they say, we're not in business. I find it interesting that on the campaign trail that people say, we want to send a businessman to the capital. And then the moment they start treating it like a business, they come out and say, we're not in the business. Number two, people say we ought to be funding core services, and there are some certain core services that we need to fund. And yet I'm unable yet to find any five people who can agree on what all the core services are. How are we going to fund those, and how are we going to move forward? Do we need to downsize? Absolutely. We're working on that, and I think it's going to be good. I want to close with this thing tonight, and uh, again, we'll talk about something that's a little bit controversial, is our, our Second Amendment. I am very much Second Amendment. I am pro-Second Amendment. There's no doubt about it. But as a state, we've got to also say, can we be wise in our Second Amendment? In our Second Amendment rights. This year, voted for uh, the idea that switchblades are now legal in the state of Oklahoma. That was a Second Amendment issue. That was wise to go ahead and vote for that because, you see, it was legal for you to buy. It was legal for you to have it in your house. But the moment you stepped on your front porch with it, they could arrest you. So we just harmonized that law. We had a bill this year that I voted for, and it passed out of the Senate, that gave people the right to carry their firearms at every event in the state of Oklahoma. The governor vetoed that. She vetoed it for the reason of simply saying that we have legislation that's ongoing in Norman. It's not right for me to get involved in that while this legislation is going on. I think we'll see it again this next year. And we're going to see it coupled with another bill this next year. Here's what happened. Whenever the news got out that we were going to allow our citizens in the state of Oklahoma to carry their weapons anywhere they wanted to go, we had two major ball team franchises. I was in Tulsa the other night meeting with one of them that said, if that happens, we will hold no more sporting events in Oklahoma. The insurance risk for us is too high if we know that everyone inside a Thunder Stadium is going to be packing heat. And so now, as one who is pro-Second Amendment, we're going to be looked at this next year to make a decision. See, Second Amendment, whenever I grew up, was you had your firearm, kill your animals, protect your family. But do we want everybody to have the right to carry a gun, whether it be at the ballpark in Tulsa, whether it be at Expo Square, or whether it be anywhere, they can strap that gun on their hip and walk in there with it. That's a decision that's going to be a difficult decision for a couple of reasons. Number one is, I'm very pro-Second Amendment. But now the Second Amendment folks, whenever they begin to look at some of that, the NRA, I suggest that that's going to be a difficult decision. And if you look at my rating, it dropped from an A-plus to an A. It's simply because I said that's going to be a difficult decision. We need money for the state of Oklahoma. Have we really hurt our Second Amendment if we don't go there? Number two. Texas passed this year, and I think we're going to see it next year, is guns on college campuses. <coughs> right here at OSU. Every law enforcement officer that we've talked to, and I talked to every president of colleges within our district, Chancellor Johnson, everyone else that's around there, there's not a one in the state of Oklahoma that wants that. The police say if we show up on site on a college campus and everybody's got guns drawn, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys? Police also say on college campuses they have a tendency to mix alcohol with life every now and then. Are we really anti-Second Amendment if we leave those gun permits in the hands of the college presidents and they have that right today? Bill Path, Dr. Path right here in Opogie can give you the right to carry a gun on this campus. He has a right to do that. That's a hard vote because I'm very pro-Second Amendment. I think we're going to have to think about some of those things when we come out and say, which direction do we want to go? And why are we making those decisions that are out there? And so I'm going to solicit your prayers about that, solicit your comments about that, 
because we will see both those things back this next year. And both of those come with a price tag. For some of our colleges, out-of-state tuition funds a lot of our colleges, so our in-state students do not have to fund. Students have already said if they pass that in Texas, maybe you read articles, some of those students are leaving that are in their out-of-state. Going to have consequences. Is it an important enough issue for us to push that says we want them to carry that if that's going to take place? That's the decision that's going to come in the next session. I guarantee it's going to be back on the table. Yes, sir. Didn't Texas vote that in? Yes, it did. Yeah. That's why I think it's coming our way. <coughs> it's coming our way. There's talk of it this year. It came our way. Talk of overriding the governor's veto this year. And I met with people about overriding the veto, and I said, you know, I've really got mixed opinion about it. So I want to make sure we're going to do it, and then let's sit down and study it. And it never got to the table to override the governor's veto. And so there are consequences goes all the way through. I want to say this, my office is open year round. Uh, we're working on some constituents things today. I'm, I'm going to talk to uh, Susan on a daily basis. Uh, we can help in a number of ways. Uh, we had a man who had money that was tied up in an escrow company for three years. It took us about three days to get it released. Uh, today we're dealing in a lawsuit that was involved in and uh, came to find out the man never received any of his money and yet he was offered a settlement. And uh, his lawyer never conveyed that. I served on the Oklahoma Bar Association Professional Responsibility Commission uh, for a couple of terms. And, and Judge, I think there's going to be some calls made concerning that. If an offer's made, that lawyer's duty bound to bring it to him. We're doing all those type of things that are up there, and we're going to continue to work throughout the session. If you want to talk about any particular bill at any particular time, I'd like to have an opportunity to explain where I'm at on that bill. And maybe after we sit down across the table and talk for a while, you can say, well, I see where he's coming from. Because sometimes there's information up there that you're not privileged to what you hear is on the news. And what's on the news is not always what's going on inside the chambers or even inside of, of our building. I want to explain one other vote and then, and I'm sorry, sir, I went over about five minutes. I, I voted not, I voted against deducting the teacher's dues. Uh, out of their paychecks. And I want to tell you why I voted against that. I called OEA in the day before the vote and said, I am voting tomorrow against that bill. Do not get the idea that I like you. All I've ever heard of gripes and complaints, you never come into my office, you never sit here and talk about what we can do for education, you're always talking about what we can do for you. So do not get the idea. I'm voting against that for two reasons. Number one, the last four years, in our Department of Education, under Superintendent Morisi, we have had every teacher and almost every superintendent in the state alienated. Whether you agree with their policy or not, and I agree with a lot of them. Superintendent Hoffmeister was just getting some of that ironed out that we're talking to our teachers and working for our teachers and getting to be a state again. Why would we want to intentionally single out teachers on the OEA that we're not going to allow school to deduct their dues. Number two, and I argued about it, if this is really what we're about as a party, this is good policy, not politics, but a good policy, then the firemen and the policemen and every other one should have had the very same policy passed at the very same time that no one, a state government, can deduct dues out of anyone's paycheck that is part of a union. Now that's policy. Singling out the teachers, that's politics. I want to be policy above politics. And if you begin to notice, read today's paper, it looks like that bill's not going to hold water anyway. It's going to fall in a lawsuit. Those are the reasons you may agree and you may disagree, and we both got the right to do that. Those are the reasons I voted and where I voted on those things. I hope this has been helpful to you tonight. You have all the materials before you. Uh, our thing is electronic. Anything else I can get for you, I'll be glad to get for you and uh, let you know exactly where we are. I think the budget is the most valuable thing you're holding in your hand tonight because you're going to hear all kinds of rumors what's out there. You're holding in your hand what the governor signed. That's exactly what she signed. And that's the budget we're working under in the state of Oklahoma. Any, any questions? Can I take a couple of questions? Any questions about anyone? I, just, I'm glad you I got a comment, and that is, when you talk about fees that agencies, I work with higher education 43 years, and. And one of the things that happens is a lot of times those fees that students are charged and that, that they, they never go away. I mean, you know, that there'll be a, a fee charged for 
building a building, you know, because that's one of those things that, that happens. Right. And what you end up, the building might be paid for, and they continue to withdraw those fees, right. and they never go, go away. Right. Those fees, they're they're outlandish. Right. I mean, they are. You look at, 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 at OSU, mm -hmm. and it's just unbelievable at times. That's right. So, and, and dealing with internet fees and those things. Oh, yeah. He reminded me of a point here, <laughs> is that uh, our OMIS, uh, Oklahoma, is the Office of Management and Enterprise Services. We were in buildings out, and they're supposed to take care of our buildings and infrastructure. They are charging the Department of Transportation $1.8 million a year rent. So I asked them, why are you charging the Department of Transportation $1.8 million a year rent? They said, well, they have a bond issue they're paying off. And the payment's $1.8 million a year. That's true, except it paid off 12 years ago. Yeah. They're still charging that much. That's just, that's just one. Yes, sir. Right. And with respect to the number of employees, for capital. Yes, sir. We say, well, where do we rank uh, in with the other 49 states? I do not know. I do not know. I've heard generalized discussion on that that we're pretty high uh, in that. Some of that uh, discussion I was in because I'm on the education committee was within our school districts. I mean, we're 532 school districts. Some of them have like 141 and states our size. And uh, but overall government employees, I do not have the answer to that, but I will look into it. Yes, sir. sir uh, you mentioned that the counties have a five-year plan for roads and bridges. Yes, sir. And uh, I guess that's being met. If I understood correctly, that's, that's good to go. But now with, with all the flooding, flood damage we have, I, I didn't understand. Where, where do we stand on that? Okay. First of all, federal government's here and state here. Uh, are working together with the emergency management. They will look at that. We have some challenges from the federal end of it uh, for the money they're going to do because they're wanting now to have at least $3,000 per incident to, to uh, get federal funds through FEMA. The problem is, if you go down to McIntosh County, talk to their commissioner there, uh, Tim, those bridges they're putting in are $1,300 a piece. So FEMA has done two things to us. One is they have separated the two catastrophes that we've had. Uh, the first one, Matter of fact, I was over in uh, Muskoka, I think it was Lincoln Reagan then or something over there, you know, the, the early rain that came through. And whenever that came through, that washed down into McIntosh County, even though they didn't have the first one. So we got to qualify on that one. And then came the flooding after May the 10th. So they divided them into two and then $3,000 per incident trying to hold back the money. What we're doing, we're trying to combine those back into one and bring that down to 3000 like a section of road so we can get the FEMA money coming in. We should get the majority of that back from FEMA. Now, the roads that are washed out, we've already received over a million dollars for some of those roads. Uh, the rest of them, we're waiting for it to come back. Now, our county commissioners will have some funds to go ahead and go forward once it has been inspected. Then they come back and do that. So there will be money that will be coming in to offset some of the damage that's out there. So it doesn't affect your five-year plan. Right. I can't speak to everyone. Uh, I talked to Max Henry, one of our commissioners. He had, in his account, $400,000 left over from the last catastrophe, so he's able to go right to work on his as soon as FEMA looks at it. Does not affect the five-year plan on roads and bridges. They're still there. And when they say it makes you stretch that out to a year plan, that's not true. Yes, sir. You started out talking about departmental budgets and funds that you currently that you're saying at the end of the year they got money left over they did not spend. Right. Okay. How did the money get into the budget? Are they not required to do a zero based budget anymore? They prepare a budget? Uh, it, it's interesting and I've got the bill number down here. They have not been. And uh, this year we were able to pass, and let's see what the, the bill is, some tax reform. And maybe the bill won't make any difference. But anyway, we passed a bill this year that says it will be at uh, zero performance balance budgeting and zero base budgeting. As you come back, what money do you really need? So that's something new. That's something new. We've not been there. I thought we did. It's kind of, we're supposed to be there, but we're not there. Mm. Right. And, and that's just like this sheet right here. If, if you look at the balances they would have, they all of them still have money in it after all these amounts were taken. And again, when they come back and they say, you took my money, uh, my point is, it's not your money. It belongs to the people of Oklahoma. This is your money, not their money. All right, yes, ma'am. What are you going to do in the off season when you're not out there? What do I do? Yeah, what are you going to do? Uh, very, very good question. Uh, number one, and uh, I travel around explaining my vote on OK Pops quite a bit. 
Uh, no, I, uh, I spend one or two days at the Capitol. I've got 19 agencies that, that I'm over. And quite frankly, this last year, uh, first of all, I read every bill before I voted on it. And that got pretty difficult toward the end of it. I got up at 4.30 in the morning, uh, was at the Capitol by 6, and generally got back to Okima by about 9.30 or 10 at night, something nice later than that, and then turned right back around and bill the next time. Mm. But these agencies, understanding the finances, because if you look just on this one chart, how a little bit of money can be broken down in different areas. And so this summer, I went to Jason Neal, who's our fiscal analyst, and I said, I want you to become my teacher. And so we're having classes one day a week that we're going over every detail, and then I'm going out and visiting those agencies personally and uh, getting acquainted with what's going on. The second thing that we are doing inside the off-season is we'll have some interim studies that are going on. And those will be back at the Capitol. They'll start next month. Uh, we're just looking at different issues that are coming up. One of those issues we're studying is our administration. I mentioned a while ago, 532 school districts. Is there a way we can save money? Some ideas have been thrown out there. Why don't we have one school district per county? Uh, we've got 101 house seats. Why don't we have 101 school districts? Uh, how can we look at something that's going to make us save money within our school districts and do some things? And a uh, very interesting study. So we'll do some of those interim studies at the same time. Uh, this is the second place that I've spoken today and uh, been out. The other thing that we do is continually, as I said a while ago, work with our constituents. I have been in all three of our counties since the flood, meeting with county commissioners, talking to them, finding out what they need to do. Uh, a, a point was raised here in Okmulgee County that I'm working on with the auditor's office is a new law on auditing says that you cannot uh, hire a company to do labor for you for like six months. That's what the old law said. Now that you've got to bid out a contract for every time they build a bridge, they've got to bid out the labor into that. And so for Omoga County and for every other county, it's costing you more money to bid every contract that comes in for labor when you used to be able to just hire a company. So for six months, this is the labor bid. And so we're working with the auditor now trying to get a clarification. We'll probably have to do some legislation this next year uh, to be able to fix that. And so, and then also I'm doing additional training, which is not paid for by the state. Uh, I'm working hard on the education committee. Ask me on education because of the problem. Uh, with Colorado Springs recently, it was paid for by Bill Gates. Uh, Pam and I will be in Naples, Florida, uh, coming up toward the end of the month at the Southeast Education Conference. And uh, Glenn Johnson is vice chair of that. We're still working on education. Now I've got one in Georgia. And so we're working on education, what's going on in different areas. How can that apply here in the state of Oklahoma? And I think there's some neat things. I'll share this one with you very briefly. Is in Colorado, they've upped some of their grades simply by having flip classes. And what they mean by that is, generally a professor or a teacher will teach during the day, send you home tonight to do homework. Your parents have no idea what you're doing. And so they try to help you. And then they come back to school. Flip classes is the kid goes home at night on their computer and they watch the, the lesson. The teacher teaches and lectures. And then in the classes, the teachers are helping with their homework and doing the discussions. All the great ones went up and they're doing a great job there. So it's just some things like that that we're looking at and, and trying to learn. So that's part of my off session uh, that we'll be doing. It is, uh, I'm still looking for the part time of this thing. <laughs> it's, just, it's, not, it's just not happened yet. I guarantee. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, this, uh, clarify something that yes, I, I'm not sure about it. You mentioned that Second Amendment yes, sir. Uh, bill that was proposed for uh, uh, carry, uh, yes. carry laws for uh, public events. Yes, sir. And I understood that uh, that the stadium, baseball stadiums and football stadiums and all that, that's already a, uh, a no-carry area, and, then, right. and it wasn't to change that. Right. We do not, and we want that clarified. Jack Fry is carrying this bill, and Jack and I talk a lot about it. I'd love to have that clarified, because if this bill trumps that, we're in trouble. Yeah, We're going to have to make it abundantly clear if it passes, it does not trump that. Yeah, and I, and I will uh, definitely agree with that. But I understood this bill was for, I think, uh, a city had leased some city, a street, right, city right. property and they had have a parade or something. Yeah. Uh, anytime, though, I think that, uh, just take the Second Amendment as part of it, but take it out of it. I think anytime that you write a piece of legislation to address one problem, it's not good legislation. If it's a statewide problem, then we need some legislation to address it. But if it's a one-time event or a problem, we don't need to address that and then look at it. But we just got to be real clear. And uh, it's a delicate thing because the political side of that thing, Second Amendment's strong, and I'm pro-Second Amendment. Yeah. But if they come out and send out those little orange cards that you voted against open carry, you know, you can kiss your political career goodbye. Well, number one, I got into this to make a difference for the state of Oklahoma. If they send me home in four years, I'll go home. But number two is, I want people to know what the facts are. Let's be honest. Yeah. Let's just have an honest discussion that goes on. Any other questions, comments? Yes, sir. 
Actually, when you get around the Second Amendment, <coughs> I think the Second Amendment is pretty clear. Mm -hmm. You got the right to bear arms. Yeah. Is that not being that they're not being infringed? Right. Thing is, does the people that you're carrying those arms onto their property, like here at OSU, have the right to say we don't want you carrying that arm on here? Well, I think a private person does. Yes. Mm -hmm. A public thing, I don't know. And I personally think probably a ball field could be belong to a private person, maybe. Mm -hmm. So we're we're along the same line, man. Yeah. I like that. I don't know part. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me here tonight. And folks, these are just extra copies that I've got.